Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. We've got Bronson Hill. Bronson, appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, Darren. Really excited to be here, man. Love your show. Love what we're talking about. And just really excited for having this conversation. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to it as well. So appreciate you coming on. Hey, um, just a little bit on how we know each other. So for the listener's uh, perspective, um, this is our first time actually talking, but I know of Bronson through social media and I'm excited to get him on here and he's doing great stuff. So, um, you know, with that, can you share with the listeners how many properties and how many units you're invested in? Yeah, so we've got, we just sold uh, multifamily yesterday. We've got, uh, I think, nine properties and it's right around 2,000 units um, total. Yeah. And what markets do you focus on? So we're value add multifamily, mostly in Jacksonville, Florida. We love that market just because the growth is happening. We're just seeing some huge upside as far as population growth and rents and other things. Uh, we also have uh, about 500 units in Atlanta. And then we have a property in Huntsville, Alabama. It's about 300 units. Awesome. And you live in sunny LA. So why don't you invest in California? <laughs> well, there's a saying, you know, yeah. You're driving all, you're flying all the way across the coast. Yeah, I, I do it just because I want to get the mileage, you know, yeah, I just right. want to be like upgraded. You know, um, yeah, I wish that were the case. No, I, I, it's funny. People ask, like, you don't own anything. I literally don't even own the house I live in in California. And we have are over 2000 units. People say, why do you do that? And there's a saying that, um, you know, invest where uh, invest live where you want and invest where the numbers make sense. Now, since COVID, I've had a lot of questions about, oh my gosh, why do we live in California? Because just like <laughs> right. the common sense way of doing everything is just like, we just find the exact opposite. And all the California neighbors look at each other and say, this is a really good idea. And I'm like, no, it's not a good idea. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I, I live here and there's some reasons for that, which is another topic. But, um, you know, I, we, all of our stuff is, you know, we have about 1500 units just in Jacksonville. So I spent a bit of time out there and I have some partners and we do a lot of work out there. So I, I just love that market a lot. And yeah, maybe if I Eventually, maybe one day we'll move. We'll move. So we'll see. Yeah. So, you know, I would say, and, you know, if listeners have, have listened to a number of shows, you, you probably have heard, um, you know, I look for, you know, landlord friendly states, states that have, that are growing, growing population, growing income. Um, and uh, Jacksonville definitely fits in that category. Atlanta definitely fits in that category. I like Tennessee, Arizona, Texas. I live in Texas. It's been going like gangbusters. Uh, but it's tough when you're in California or New York and you have tenants and they want to, you know, and they stop paying. It's difficult to get them out, you know. So yeah. that's for the listener who has not had that problem before. That's why you want to be in in landlord friendly states where you have the laws that benefit the landlord versus the tenant. Yeah, it's really absolutely true. I mean, basically, you just take the opposite of California's policies, like like rent control, uh, <laughs> no landlord rights. I mean, they extended the eviction moratorium in the city of Los Angeles. I live in Pasadena, which is nearby, but city of LA, it's extended now to June of 2023. So there's really nothing you can do to get people out of the, your uh, house or anything. It's, uh, UCLA recently did a study and they found that about 50% of tenants in the city of LA have stopped paying rent. Wow, so can that's you imagine crazy. There, and at this point, there's no more, as far as I understand, there's no more state relief. There's no more local relief for, for landlords. So again, it's very difficult versus I think it's Alabama. It's either Alabama or Arkansas. If somebody stops paying, you can get them out, I think, in three days. I think there's Holy like God. a very short one. I, I mean, I don't know if that's right, but at least you have, you, know, you want to work with anybody you can. But it's just, you know, this idea of waiting months and months or having no recourse to get people out and you're still having to pay everything. Um so I, I do invest, you know, for a lot of reasons in, in the Southeast and the Sun Belt, um, And those are a couple of reasons why. Yeah, that's huge. Hey, so um, checked out your website and I see that you've got a, you know, free ebook that people can download. And, it's, and I think it's extremely pertinent to what's going on in the market right now. You know, there's huge inflation. And so, you know, talk about that ebook and, and what that's all about and what you're talking about in there. 
Yeah, so the ebook is at bronsonequity.com. It's just how to use inflation to your advantage. So it's 50 plus color pages. And it basically just tries to give strategies into uh, instead of you going to the pump and saying, oh my gosh, everything just costs more or, uh, you know, buying food at the store, just being kind of hit by the negative parts of inflation. There's actually a way you actually can be on the other side of that where you're actually uh, not only weathering it, but you're thriving through inflation. So uh, debt such as real estate debt, you know, having an interest rate of, you know, 3% or even 8%, whatever it is. I, th I personally think inflation is more like, uh, you know, somewhere around 15 or 18%. If you look at a website called Shadow Stats, they say that if you use actual uh, information, actual data, that's actually what inflation really is right now. But the federal government likes to kind of have this fudged number about this called the CPI, where they just, they, they kind of make it what they want it to make. But if again, if you're taking uh, real estate, you're using debt to buy these assets at the debt is a lower rate than what inflation is. You're buying the asset, which you know will be worth more in the future because they're going to keep creating more currency. Like it's just almost inevitable. So it'll be worth more in the future and you get to pay it off in future dollars that are worth less. So there's so many advantages. So again, if a property goes up by 20%, uh, and you only put 20% down, you haven't increased by 20%, you've actually doubled your equity, right? So that's really the magic of a high inflation time is getting into as, as many assets um, that you can, particularly real estate or multifamily real estate. Yeah, that's huge. You know, to, to simplify that for the, for the investors, if you're in a fixed debt, you've locked in your, your debt service costs, you know, whether, like you said, whether it's a 3% rate or an 8% rate, that is fixed throughout the term of the, of the loan. But then if there's massive inflation, whether it's, you know, the CPI at 8, per, 8 9%, or you mentioned shadow stats at 15, 18%. Well, if there's true wage inflation, then tenants should be able to pay higher rents as time goes on. And so that top line is going to continue to increase at the property, yet your debt service costs are going to remain constant. That's if you have fixed debt, right? Right. So, so that gap is what is the inflation hedge, right? That, that you're referring to in, in that book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, you know, it's really an arbitrage, right? I mean, another, another way to take advantage of this, um, and you do it when you take out debt. Um, I was actually able to get about a year ago, I found a something called a personal line of credit, which is basically a bank saying, hey, we're going to loan you money. It's like a HELOC or a home equity line of credit, but it doesn't come out of your equity. So it's just simply somebody say, hey, I'm going to loan you money, believing you're going to pay it back. And I got terms of uh, 2.75 interest rates, so a very low interest rate fixed for 10 years. And it was interest only for the first two years. So I'm basically getting almost free money to borrow because I know I can get probably around 15 or 20% per year in my investments. And so it's basically an arbitrage, right? You're borrowing at a cheaper rate to go get a higher return on investment that you feel secure about. Now, I'm not giving you any specific advice, but those are strategies that a lot of wealthy people use because they're able to use it to their advantage. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's huge. That's the same as, you know, somebody that has, there's a lot of people that have the thought process and, and it's what you're comfortable with. So listeners, like you, <laughs> we we're saying this is not, purely advice. This is just talking about different options. Um, there's some people that just have peace of mind that they just want to pay down their mortgage, right? And so say you have a $500,000 house. If you pay down the, the mortgage, well, if there's appreciation in that house, you're getting appreciation on that 500000 But if you were to take out a home equity line and then put that into another deal, then you, now you have two assets that could be potentially appreciating. Mm -hmm. And so some people are comfortable with that and some people are not. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, uh, and again, it, it comes down to your own tolerance of risk or just your ability, your, how certain do you feel your investments are? I mean, you heard about the stories in 2008, 2009, where people lost everything. It's because they, they had too much leverage. There was adjustable rate mortgages, and they just, they had too many things going on and then everything turned all at the same time and they didn't have the liquidity to cover that, right? But if you're talking fixed long-term, if I know I can get a higher return and that's more of a fixed rate or it's, there's much more certainty in that. And, you know, if it doesn't go well, I'm able to cover that. So you, you want to make sure you're, you're wise in how you approach it. But um, these are strategies a lot of people use. I mean, you see it even in businesses or like when, when a business will buy another business as a private equity or a buyout, 
a lot of times they'll finance a lot of the costs or they'll try to find a way to finance it. And so it's a way that, you know, they can basically say, hey, we're buying at a lower rate or we're getting money at a lower rate to go buy something that we see a much higher return. And that, it's really a value add type of thing, right? You're taking money and you're finding a way to, to, to basically find a higher return on it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it, like you said, buying, buying other businesses, they do the same exact thing. They're looking at, okay, I can borrow at this rate and, but, it's a value add opportunity. If we come in there, we think we can increase the profitability of that company that much more and we can get that spread. So um, now talk about the difference though in this with fixed financing versus floating because I know a lot of syndicators that the last two, three years has been pr predominantly bridge financing. So f floating, Three one one type of structure, um, floating rate debt, three years, and then with two one year extensions. Um, so, what's your take on floating versus fixed? Um, the people that were paying higher for fixed, they look like heroes now. But <laughs> back, back in the early, you know, last year and, and beginning of this year, people were like, "Why aren't you taking the cheap floating rate debt?" Yeah, it's, it's really challenging. I mean, there's there's two sides to this. You know, if anybody's in uh, multifamily, large multifamily real estate, is do you take fixed or do you do bridge floating? About 85, 90% of the large debt out there is bridge debt. So it is more kind of two, three year with, you know, maybe some extensions built in. And so we've done a lot of that. We've also done a lot of fixed stuff. But the challenge with the fixed stuff is that, you know, it's if you sell it in less than five years, or you refinance less than five years, often there's a huge prepayment penalty. So we've paid millions of dollars in prepayment penalties for having a fixed rate that we ended up selling early. So it, it's challenging. I, mean, I still think um, it's getting, uh, this is where it's getting really challenging in multifamily, finding a deal that makes sense with debt that makes sense, because the thing that's really changed is obviously the interest rates have come up, but also the interest rate caps. So the, the, uh, the kind of the insurance you're paying to have a cap on your floating rate. Most deals now make you buy those and you could be paying a million dollars a year for those cap rates that just to cap how, how high that will go. Um, so there's some issues. So we, we had some that are, are lower and we've had the caps that we bought a while ago, so they're doing fine. Um, some of the, you know, the, the rates or the costs of those have come up. Um, I have felt in general, it's still a great time to buy the right multifamily deal. Um, I personally like B and C class with it, with a strong value add because if you have a brand new apartment, uh, first of all, you're getting premium rents. So like where I live in Pasadena, California, two bedroom apartments in a nice area are going for 4,200 a month. How if much? There's a recession, 4,200 a month. 4,200? Yeah, 4,200 yeah, oh, $4, dollars a month. And this is you know a nice part of Pasadena, but in a recession, they're not gonna get 4,200 a month. So I look at that, it's more of like a class A, you know, they're not brand new, but they're in the best part of town. They're really high end above some shopping center kind of thing, and they're really nice, right? So if there's a recession, they might end up getting 3,500 or 3,000, or that will come down versus people in B and C class or working class apartments. We know if we can do renovations on these units, and we can renovate 80% of the units, we can see uh, sometimes a 50% or greater upside in the rents. So that puts what, Mark, what Warren Buffett calls a margin of safety, right? Margin of safety is just that we come in, if things don't go really well, do we still have some sort of margin there, right? With the class A, it's, it's harder to find that. Now people do it and they love it and that's fine. I think that's, you gotta do what business model makes sense. And there are people that say actually class A are lower risk, but I, I personally think uh, the class A stuff is a little higher risk for that reason. So that's why we focus on that. So even, and so we feel like I'm kind of bringing this around. If we're able to do this value add on our property in Jacksonville with 350 units and we can renovate 80% of those units in the next two years, because we're increasing the income dramatically, we're increasing the value dramatically by doing that, right? It's different in single family, which is based on comps. The value of a property is based on what the house across the street or across town sold for. With multifamily, it's based on the value of you know how much income is coming in. So if we can increase the income, even if interest rates keep going up, even if other issues happen with valuations, we still feel like we have a good margin of safety and we're going to be just fine. The deals are going to perform really well. That was a very yeah. long winded answer. <laughs> it, you no, know, but it, I think it was, it was helpful for people. Now, now the, a couple, two kind of questions off of that or, or notations or whatever. One is, I think the million dollar question, you know, we were talking about before that if your top line is growing, and your debt service is, is locked in, or you know your debt service is gonna be less than your top line, so there's still gonna be growth in, in profitability. But the question mark is, is that growth and profitability going to 
have a bigger impact than the increase in cap rates. Because as interest rates rise, cap rates should rise as well. And that negatively impacts the valuation of of properties. So now you've got more, a greater NOI, but you've got a higher cap rate. So which one has a bigger impact? And I, I think that, I'm not sure that anybody has that crystal ball. Yeah, you can actually calculate that. So yeah, the question, yeah, if, if valuations, what it means is, is if the value of properties go down, uh, you know, based on how much income they're making, which your know, cap rates are going are going higher, right? Because it just means that you're um, you're paying you're you're being able to buy and pay less money to get more income. So it's basically reducing the value of properties. Um, if that happens, and you know, we expect that to happen, uh, at least in the short run. And so, you know, again, it, you can you can calculate that out saying if we we feel like if we can increase the income of the property by 40, 50 percent, which we feel like is confident based on knowing what the rents are already in Jacksonville, we feel like they're going to continue to grow because of rent growth and other things that are happening. But um, the other the other side of this that's really interesting that most people don't think about because I want to kind of play this in reverse a little bit, too, is that rates are rising. There's the thought that, oh, the Fed's going to raise rates for the next year or two. They're going to go sky high. We're going to keep going higher and higher and higher. I personally, my opinion is that there's going to be a point where things shift, where one of two things are going to happen, where they're going to say, um, you know, something in the financial system is going to break. I don't know if it's going to be in real estate, but something's going to break. Some, something's not going to be able to handle lending jumping this quickly. And somewhere there's going to be some freeze up in supply chain or something's going to happen. And they're going to say, oh my gosh, we just can't handle this. Or we're going to be in some sort of re- big recession. And they're going to say, we just can't keep raising rates like this. And I think they're actually going to start reversing course again. And that's historically, if you look at it, uh, there's a friend of mine, Jeff Clark, who uh, is a part of, it's called goldsilver.com. He does more stuff in the precious metal space. He says, typically the Fed will will raise rates from five months uh, to 13 months. And the longest they really ever keep raising rates before they lower, or they have one, you know, lowering of rates at 13 months. And so that's the case And we're already, you know, seven, eight, nine months into, it. I think it was March was the, was the last time, you know, first time they raised rates. So we're kind of in the middle of this. So at some point, the momentum will shift. And then what happens, right? This is the big aha moment for investors. I think we're gonna have a moment where we look back and say, you know, remember when rates went really high and, you know, we were was afraid to buy? Right. Well, I man, we should have doubled down and bought more because when you buy, what happens? Two things happen. One is the, the buying price is fixed, right? That doesn't change, but the interest rate can be adjusted later. So if what happens if rates go down from seven or 8%, whatever they are down to four or 5%, oh my gosh, well then all this money floods back into real estate and people that own stuff, it's not worth a lot more. So I, th- I actually think it's a great plan to buy now. If you can just make the cash flow work. I mean, there's not as fewer buyers out there. Ownership costs are going up, which I think are also going to drive rents. But I, I personally think it's a great time. I just think it's people are a little concerned, but I think it actually people will kick ourselves that we didn't buy more right now. Yeah, that, that's really interesting because it, it's true. Like, so you can end up, you know, buying a deal now. And even if you have the prepayment penalty, you know, well, let's let's talk about if you buy the deal now and even if you have a higher interest rate, somebody can come in with lower lower debt with new financing and, and make the deal work at a, at a higher valuation. Um, or you could potentially refinance into to lower interest rate debt and, and pull money out of the deal. So those are those are two attractive things. I read a article this morning from I was out from Bigger Pockets and it was saying exactly just that that you know it's you know look there's never any guarantee but there are a number of people that are now kind of thinking that in 2023 you know mortgage interest rates should should come down because of one of those scenarios. Now, again, we, we don't know. We'll see. Um, I had some syndicators at the beginning of the year say that the Fed's going to raise rates once and be one and done and have to turn around. And that obviously was not you know, <laughs> correct. So who knows? Hey, I want to get your take on because you were talking about uh, BC. Um, a couple things. One, I want to share with the listeners that, you know, Bronson is not guessing when he buys a deal and says he can raise rates because he looks at the properties around the deal he's buying and he can see these properties are already getting those rents. If I just do the upgrades, I should be able to get the same rents. So it's not like he's trying to push 
rents 50% past where they already are. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. So the term, there's really two types of appreciation in deals, right? You've got market appreciation, which is we've seen in Jacksonville just in the market, rents have come up 19% in the last 10 months. So that's just saying whatever rents are or what they've been, they're just continuing to come up. That's just happening in the market. There's a different type of appreciation that's called forced appreciation, right? It's saying uh, I can come into this particular unit of this size and because we have 1500 units in Jacksonville that are within a few mile, I mean, just all just in, the, you know, right in that area, we know that, hey, the going rate, it's $1,000 right now is what we're getting, but we know people move, you know, half the people are gonna move every year. So when people move out, we'll come in and we'll do a renovation, spend $6,000, and we know the going rate is $1,550 for that unit. So that's what, you know, that's why we have confidence going in. So again, that's not even just external, whatever. And even if we're wrong on that number, even if we're like, the rents come down 10 or 20%, we've still got a huge upside, right? Maybe we raise them 40%, whatever. So we just know as long as we can keep renovating units, and keep getting higher rent in an area that's growing, we know we're gonna be just fine. So that's why I feel really great about being in that market in particular, and also buying value add products properties that have the opportunity for forced appreciation. Yeah, that's huge. So now I want to talk a little bit about so kind of the other side of the coin. I've had some syndicators, a lot of syndicators have kind of shifted from BC to, you know, wanting to get more into the B plus A, um, you know, type assets. And one of the arguments for that is that all right, on a BC deal, um, the income qualification typically for a tenant is three to one. So you know they don't, you don't want to you want to have their the rent be thirty percent of of their income. And on an A property, it's really you know one out of six. So so they have a lot more room um, to you know, a lot more buffer. Um, it if there is a downturn. So that's their argument. Um, in addition to that, because there's been inflation, some of these A properties, you know, they're raising rents without even having to upgrade the unit, you know, when on, on a renewal by 15, 20%. It's, it's crazy. So mm -hmm. what's your take on those two things? Yeah. So um, I'm going to see if I got all of it, but uh, you know, we can, kind of fill me in if I missed a part of it. But it, so right now you look at kind of what REITs are doing and that's when I look at like the class A, it's, it's a lot of REITs. So REITs are real estate investment trusts. And what does that mean? That's basically like a publicly traded company that owns hundreds or thousands or even tens of like many, many large properties. Typically they're buying the nicest, newest properties in the best areas. But if you watch the performance of REITs, they really kind of go, you own the you own the real estate market. So you're just simply going up when things are going up, and you're going down when things are going down. And I what I've realized is you can basically invest in just owning an asset, which is fine, but where people really do exceptionally well is they find a way to add value, right? You see this in flipping houses, right? Somebody comes in and they flip a house, right? They find a house for you know three hundred thousand dollars, they put you know fifty K into it, they can sell for five hundred, right? They've been able to add value and they find a market for this because they took something and made it better. So I just think it provides much more of a margin of safety. And I know guys that are doing really big deals where they're raising, you know, a hundred million dollars a year or raising a lot of money. But the challenge is when you're a really large REIT or like a really large or some really large influencers that can raise a hundred million or 200 million per deal, uh, they have too much money, right? So they only can go after the nicest, newest stuff. So I've watched this with syndicators that as you raise more and more money, um, now traditionally you're right, that people would say a class A is safer because it's newer, it has less things going on, uh, different things that are there. I've just found if you have a good team and you really are making, I mean, I always say you have to have a degree of confidence that you can fulfill the business plan. And so, you know, there are always deals that go wrong and there's underperformance, there's things that happen. But I think in general, if you can find some way to increase value, I mean, it's just like, it's, but it's a similar conversation. Do you buy a brand new house and live there? Or do you buy something that's a little older? Maybe you fix it up. I think it depends on your approach. I mean, it's interesting how people choose asset classes kind of based on their personality. I've never done any ground up development. I have friends that only do ground up development and they love it. So it's the same with class A versus B and C. So I've just found that I love B and C. Uh, I personally see some risk in class A, but uh, some people, they just, they feel more comfortable with it. And that's how you got to do what feels comfortable for you. Right. Um, the other thing I, I like what you said is, is that, you know, in a, BC, you can, you know, you can find the properties that around it that are already achieving the rents, but you guys already have 
you know, 1,000 units or 1,500 units in that area that you can see your own data and, yeah. and have that additional confidence. So it's not just looking at competitors. It's looking at the performance of your own data as well. Yeah, yeah. It basically it becomes um, it's it's a repeatable business process, right? It's and that's where I see deals that get in trouble. Uh, this is a very common one where I see where a I'll hear about a deal and I passively invest in things outside of multifamily, even within multifamily. I pass and invest in other deals, but I'll see somebody saying, "Hey, we got this great deal, and we've got this property manager in this market, and they're going to go to this other market two hours away, and they're a great property manager, but they're going to go over. There. They have no units over there. They're going to go over there, and we're going to be our first one over there, and it's going to be awesome." And I've just seen issues with it because, right? Because they have, okay, they have a repeatable thing with this manager they've done very well. But in this other area, this property manager, they may not have staff over there. They probably don't have any staff. They don't have maybe local vendor contacts to help do these renovations, whatever. And I've seen property managers struggle with that, right? So I think um, the more repeatable, the more it's like, okay, we see this. This is a mile, two miles, five miles away. It's the same team. It's the same construction crew. It's the same property manager. We had this performance over here. We can show kind of case for case how we've done that, right? And that's why people get really comfortable when they say, oh, okay, this is this is not like your first time doing this, right? One of my partners has 28 years of experience and 13,000 units. So there's a question that, I mean, you know, he'll be able to smell a problem even before it happens, right? So that's not, right. you know, I only have, you know, four years of multifamily investing experience. I've been doing real estate for years, but I have a partner who's got all this experience. So it becomes, it just gives more strength to the team that you, you, can, you know you're going to be able to handle the things that are going to come up. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Now, you end up having... Um, Right now, in today's time, you are bullish, but the, you know my experience and the experience talking to other syndicators, there's a lot of investors, passive investors, that are part of all these deals that are scared. They're nervous. Yeah. And uh, so on this show, the listeners are a mix of passive investors, syndicators looking to scale, and then po- potentially people that are looking to just break into the industry. Um, so for the passive investors that are are scared now, what do, you know, what do you tell them? Yeah, it's, it's a great point, and we've noticed that it's getting harder to raise money, and you're having to raise more money for a deal because the loan to values have changed. Instead of putting twenty percent down on a deal or twenty five percent, we're having to put thirty, thirty five percent or more, and there's more money needed closing, and it, it can be a lot. So um, the the margins have gotten squeezed a bit. Um, I would say this to a passive investor: uh, the confused mind will always just say to wait, right? So it'll just say, you know, I'm just gonna wait and see what happens, whatever. Well, I, I personally think inflation is actually 15 to 18%. So if you've got money sitting in the bank, if you wait two years, because it could take two years before things kind of come back to kind of a normalcy, whatever, um, you could be losing 35 to 40% of your purchasing power. Now you still have your money, it just buys a lot less. So I think that's the other side. That's something we really haven't encountered in the last 40 to 50 years, we have not really encountered a time like this. You could saving was a virtue. Right now, saving is a curse. If you save, uh, you're in trouble. You're, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna lose your money just by saving. You know, Robert Kiyosaki has this thing. I think Ray Dalio says it too. That you know, sa- savers are losers. If you save, you're actually losing money. And so, um, you know, again, kind of my conversation earlier about putting money into deals that pay you to hold them. Um, I think there are actually some great deals out there right now, but again, not everybody's going to be able to see it. So we, we are still doing multifamily deals. We have some things. We have an ATM machine fund, which is something outside of real estate. It's in real estate, but kind of a, a fringe thing. We've got a kind of a more, um, a very high upside kind of oil technology deal we're working on now. So we're working on some other things that we've noticed. The investor sentiment has changed. And there is also something there, and as you know, the uh, called the wealth effect, right? If my stock market portfolio has gone down 30%, right. or if my distributions on my deal, which is happening in some deals, if have gone down, I'm a little more scared. I don't know what to sure. I need to hold more cash. But I do think for people that uh, are willing to to get in, I think I would have rather have very little of my net worth in cash, and I'd have like to have nearly all, most of it, almost all of it in deals. That's me. That's not everybody. But that's where I'm at. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I, I think that's that's a common thing right now is that people don't know what to do. And when people don't know what to do, they typically do nothing. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, and, that, you know, we saw it like, you know, look, when the when the um, covid happened, holy cow, the stock market dropped dramatically for like two weeks. Right. Mm-hmm. And and then if anybody bought at that, at that low, then 
it just went up and up and up and up and it just never came back down. And people kept just waiting like it's got to correct. It's got to correct. It's got to correct. Now, we're, this year has been another story. Um, it, the stock market has, has come down. Um, but that's what happens is like you can't see it until after the fact. Right. So I, I like what you said before that that you'd rather buy and then look back and be like, I'm glad I bought rather than kick yourself for not buying. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I think this this is a very different time. Like going back to the 70s and early 80s, we most of us had never lived or really been investors in this time. And so it's a very different time. Now, one thing that's happened that also changes this, and it's really important that you don't just pay attention to real estate. People that were only paying attention to real estate in 2008, 2009, they, they got in trouble because they didn't see the macroeconomic picture. They didn't see what was happening up here. So we talk about the Fed, we talk about monetary policy and all of this. Well, they created 40.9%, 40.9% new currency between February of 2020 and February of 2022. That's crazy. 40.9%. That's just a little like, we're just going to give money to everybody, everyone. It wasn't just at the top level, it was in people's bank accounts, it was all over. So you think about that, just, I mean, that's a lot of money. Now, once we create the money, there is no mechanism that we know of that actually to put the money back or to reduce it or anything. So everything is going to cost more and everything, even these things like the Inflation Reduction Act and these other things, they're all just more spending bills. Like we can't, we're addicted to debt and spending. So what, the reason I share that is in the future, all goods and services are going to cost more. Everything is going to cost more. Now you have to look at debt and you've got to look at how all this stuff works and can you manage it and all this stuff is very important. But in the long run, the more real assets you own, the more valuable that's going to be in dollar terms, right? So that's something I think a lot of people really miss is they don't see that that's, you know, actually, uh, you know, possible. So um, anyway, so that, that's something that I, uh, you know, I just encourage people to, to really look at. Absolutely. So you own a lot of units, a lot of properties, nine properties. Um, what are some of the learning lessons you've, you've learned by, you know, getting into these deals, managing these deals? Um, you know, any learning lessons that you can share with the listeners? Yeah, so I think one learning lesson I've had is just really making sure that you find partners that really share similar values. You know, not everybody you you talk or you know meet at an event or even you do a deal with is going to be a great long term partner. And I've had partners that I've worked with that you know they're all they're all great, all things that are strengths about them. But I've realized I've I've discovered a certain set of values. You know, I've spoken with thirteen hundred investors one on one, had a lot of conversations. I figure out you know, I feel like I really understand what it means to be a passive investor because I invest passively. I've spoken with so many people. And so I really care about uh, having a long-term partnership with investors. And I really care about clear communication and really good performance. And both of them are important. You could have a great deal and you could have poor performance, or excuse me, have great a great performance on a deal and, and poor communication or vice versa, and it's not a good experience. And so not everybody operates that way. Not everybody operates in a in more of a transparent kind of way, and that's just how I like to work. So I found some partners that I love working with and we have a similar value, and I've had some that, you know, we just, we realize we're not the best fit. And, you know, that, that's okay. It's just, you know, we're not always the best fit. So I think that's something that you only learn in time. And when you're first starting out as an investor, as a passive investor, or you're first starting out as a syndicator, you're excited to get into a deal. And either as a passive investor, you can get stuck in analysis paralysis, which is a, a trap. So it's maybe look at five deals and actually start investing with, with one of them and develop a relationship. Uh, or as a syndicator, maybe you just get into it. You just kind of find a few and you try to find a way to get into a deal because it's the hardest as a syndicator to go from zero to one. So I think just, you know, trying to meet a lot of people, going to events, going to meetups, finding a great partner is really helpful. Look, that's very consistent with what I've heard from other syndicators. It, it's typically the ones, the bad partnerships that I've heard about have not been, this guy was not competent. It was more, hey, our values didn't align. Like when there were some, you know, question marks on what to do in a certain circumstance, I wanted to handle it this way and they wanted to handle it that way. And, you know, maybe, and, and that impacted how they looked at their next partnership. They, they really spend a lot of time getting to understand, look, do we look at the world the same way? And that seems to be very important to have good partnerships. Yeah, yeah, it really is a values thing for sure. So talk about um, getting, getting uncomfortable. Like, look, getting in your first deal 
is uncomfortable and then you kind of move on and do other stuff but but the people that I've found that are successful they keep looking for ways to get uncomfortable so yeah talk about that a little bit so I have a, a good friend, uh, Robert Helms of the Real Estate Guys, and he talks about this, that you have like, you know, the, you have your comfort zone, right? Things that you know you can do, the people you enjoy hanging out with, the places you enjoy going, the things that you're comfortable with. And then you've got uh, kind of on, the, that's on the inner circle here. The outer circle is the panic zone. So it's where you go to a place and you just, you just shut down, you're absolutely panicked. Well, in between those two is what we call the growth zone, right? So it's something that, it's, it's out of your comfort zone, right? It's something that you've maybe never done before. It's maybe a, a, a deal you've never done. Some of you ever, you've never been to a certain event. You've never got up and sang karaoke. You've never done a Spartan race. You've never ran a marathon. Whatever the thing is, you get in there. And then once you, you start doing those things, and I'm a big person that's like, do the hard thing. Do things that are challenging. You know, I just finished a 13-mile Spartan race. So I trained for these races. And that's you know, awesome. a whole process of how I did that. I also uh, set up an ice bath at my house that just kind of stays cold all the time. So I'm going to start doing that every day and just try to do something hard every day because that's where all the growth happens. So what happens is you go from your growth zone, which is smaller, excuse me, your comfort zone, you do something outside of it and then your comfort zone expands. And that's how that's that kind of idea of perpetual mm -hmm. growth. So I have found in my own life, the biggest growth, uh, you know, comes from doing these things that are hard. And as we say yes to those things, um, it leads, you know, we have a breakthrough. I've had breakthroughs in my personal life, meaning I did something really hard for me personally. And I have you know, all sorts of stuff I could share on that, but it led to a breakthrough in my business where, you know, okay, I started a meetup in Pasadena, California. That's kind of how I got started in, in multifamily, met my first investor there, raised a hundred thousand dollars, went to this expensive kind of event on a cruise in 2019, made a partnership there. And together we raised $15 million over the next 18 months. Wow. Right. So that was a huge, like a rock, I call those rocket ship moments, right? Where I went from like, okay, I'm doing this and this is, but even getting the first deal, that was a big deal. But then getting somewhere where I found a partnership where I'm adding value, that was huge. So I just think as an approach in life, um, doing things that are challenging, having goals, doing something that, you know, maybe you said you'd never do and just you know, going through it, 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 it gives you more confidence to be able to do that in other areas. Yeah, I, I, that, I love that because like once you do something that you were scared to do, then it gives you confidence to do something else scary. Somebody told me the definition of courage is like taking action when you're scared. Yeah. Like even though you're scared, you still take action. That's courage. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's difficult. But think back, what was your first uh, real estate investment, by the way? Was it single uh, family or multifamily? Yeah, or what it was it? It it was single family. Yeah, I was in my mid twenties and I bought a house. Uh, I was living in Montana. I had moved there to take a job as a youth pastor, and I bought a house there and ended up keeping it as a rental and just sold it a couple of years ago. So, and was that scary for you? To well, you had already bought it and you were living in it, so it was mm -hmm. just a decision as to whether to rent it when you were leaving or whether to sell it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So, and there was a little bit of fear around that, but yeah, I think. Um, yeah, so you were going to ask uh, what my well, next because, biggest... Yeah. Because what happens, and I, you know, I think the listeners need to understand, is that like everybody starts with one investment. And like, mm. you, know, you couldn't have thought, you know, when you talk about your comfort zone and then your growth zone, like you know, when you got your first deal and then you got into multi you couldn't see all the other things that you were going to push yourself to do until you did it, you know? And so... There's, there's listeners that think like, all right, well, Bronson has 2,000 units, but I'll never do that. Like, you know, I, don't, I just want to get my first deal. But what happens is three years down the road, that person that just got their first deal, they have people in their network that are going to ask them, hey, how did you do it? And yeah. then all of a sudden they're going to be helping other people. Yeah, yeah, it... it uh... I just watched, you know, doing doing the hard thing. I mean, I never thought I'd be doing this. I never thought I'd be able to. I had a you know a job. I was making over two hundred k a year. I was doing medical sales. I was a, I was a top performer. I did it for about ten years, and uh, but I, yet I wanted to have control over my time. I wanted to do more, and so as I started to do this, I, I found a way. You know, some people think you have to replace your income. But, you know, you can also find a way to replace your expenses. And that's so kind of, they call it your rat, your rat race number. And so, but it, it does involve courage. It does involve stepping out. It does involve taking chances. But I always think of like, you know, okay, if this doesn't go well, what's the worst that could happen? 
What's the, play, what's the worst yeah. thing that can happen? So many people have told me that they've thought that. That's, yeah. that, that's brilliant. Well, because because a lot of times we, in our minds, we just kind of, oh, that'd be terrible. Because a lot of times really what it comes down to, Darren, I'm a big mindset guy. A lot of times we feel like, you know, I would be a failure if this didn't work out. If I made a goal or if I told my friends or if I actually did this, then, then it would mean that I tried and failed and therefore I'm a failure. And, and you know, in reality, like I understand that because I've totally felt that. But then I thought, you know, it doesn't have to mean that. Like it doesn't mean just because I fail. Like actually, I've really kind of come to a point where you transform any failure into learning and then you succeed. So it's just, it's all how you look at it. And so I think the mindset piece is so important because if I'm, I'm going to go do a lot of things this year and I'm going to fail at a lot of things. But yet I'm going to learn a ton. I'm going to get better. I'm going to be better next year. And so I think, you know, we're afraid to try because of the commitment, because of the time. But uh, Tony Robbins, I just I went to my first Tony Robbins event recently and he just said this. He said, it's in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. So it's in your moments of decision. So when I decided that, hey, this is enough, I'm going to leave my job. I want to have, I want to be financially free. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to do this. And it like actually changed when I made the decision. And then it actually happened years, you know, two, two, three years later, it actually, I think two years later it happened. So, you know, it's amazing when you actually make a decision, you can actually change your life. But a lot of times we don't think that that's possible. I love that. I love that. You know, and I think that there are so many people that are just afraid to try, you know, that they're, they're just afraid to try. And, and, um, I remember, like, I started my own company. I, tra- I have another company that trades loan portfolios between banks, residential, multifamily, and commercial. And um, not don't deal with the end consumers, just bank between banks. But that I started that company in 2007, and people were like, what was the hardest part of starting your own business? And I was like, signing the lease <laughs> to the office. And they're like, what, was it a big number? And I'm like, no, it was exactly what you were just saying. It was like, once I signed the lease... I was afraid that, like, I had, at that point, I had to tell my family, I had to tell my friends, I had to tell my ex-colleagues, I'm in business for myself, and that fear of failure, you know, I'm so thankful that I pushed through and, and did it, but that little moment of decision can stop so many people from going after their dreams and their goals. Yeah. No, for me, I, I had a, this is pretty personal. I had a, uh, uh, about six years ago, I went through a divorce. I was married nine years, never saw myself being divorced. And um, I think it directly relates to what we're talking about because um, I, I went through this. And obviously, anybody who's ever been through a divorce or known somebody went through a divorce, to me, it just like, just, you know, to the core, just, you know, cut me in a lot of ways. It just really broke me down. I had to say, what's my life about? What's important? And what do I want? What do I want when I'm, 80 years old or 90 years old to say, you know what, but what do I want it to look like? And I think there's this saying that says at the end of your life, you regret more of the things you didn't do than the things that you did. Right. And so, you know, I said, you know what? Um, and I turned, I was turning 40 about that time. And I just said, you know, I would regret if I didn't go a hundred percent and really try this and really go for it and really say, you know, what, I'm going to do everything I can to be successful as an entrepreneur and really make it in real estate as a syndicator. And, Honestly, that was uh, almost about a year and a half ago, and I've had no regrets. I literally had a moment. I was sitting right at this table. Anybody who's in sales or has done say, 10 years of sales, at this moment where I was imagining the end of the quarter, this was a few months after I left my job, and I imagined my boss calling and saying, hey, Bronson, how's it going? Any more sales coming in? They always kind of bug you at the end of the month. Hey, what's going on? And, and, I remember, and I remember what came out of my mouth while I was just sitting there imagining this in my mind was, thank God I'm not doing that job anymore. <laughs> Right. And so it's funny, like, you know, we look at like the downside, but to have those moments, you know, I'm on my, I'm leaving for my sixth, sixth international trip this year, next year, I'm going to Patagonia and Chile. So I'm able to do some of these things that I really have have kind of been bucket list things for me. Right. So I think it comes down to somebody being able to dream and being able to say, you know what, I, I, I don't have to do this, but if I don't do this, I'll be missed. I know I will regret it one day. And I think those things, you have to treat those things as being incredibly valuable, incredibly precious, because the world needs what you have. The world needs your, whatever your gift is, whatever your passion is, the world needs it. And there's something, look, the big man upstairs made every one of us unique. And there's something inside you. You know, look, some people love what they do. They're like, they're, they're a W-2 employee. They make a lot of money and they want to, you know, 
potentially passively invest and, and work with a syndicator and, and pass their money off. There's other people that, you know, they want to do something, but they're scared and they just can't get over the, over the edge. But I believe with you that like, look, and I know some people, I don't, some people left their job and went to do something, whether it's start a business or invest or whatever the case may be. And sometimes you have to pivot, right? Sometimes the first thing that you go after isn't a home run. And then all of a sudden you're like, but what I've noticed is people don't go back to where they were before. They pivot to something else. They're so like, hey, this may not be working, but I see this opportunity over here. And I'm going to pivot and go over here. On the, you know, real estate investing side, there was a syndicator that I talked to that um, he started out doing. He was a software engineer, started to invest. He started to invest in retail, and it it was really tough raising the capital. And then he got into multifamily, and he hit his stride. So he he pivoted. Um, you know, other people it may be to start start their own business, but. I agree with you, man. I applaud you. Good job for freaking taking that chance because it's scary to take that chance and, and it worked out for you. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think, uh, you know, I see this, it can look differently for different people. So for passive investors, I see this a lot of like, I want to leave my great job as a passive investor, but I've never invested in a deal. I right. mean, it's just getting into that first deal. So it doesn't have to be as extreme as, hey, I'm going to, you know, leave this job right now. But it, you're right. It, it, one thing builds on another and it's all momentum. Yeah, I mean, just being a passive investor, I remember I was I was scared, man, wiring the money to, on my first investment. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's it's not like going on your you know and and buying a thousand shares of, of Amazon. It's it's all of a sudden you got to sign all these documents and then you got to wire the money and like um, you know. So the first time I was nervous. Like, did I just wire the money to Never Neverland? But then <laughs> when all of a sudden you start seeing the returns. You're like, holy cow, this is pretty darn good. So talk about some of the returns. Like how, how have your deals done and you know what what have the passive investors seen from a return perspective? Yeah, yeah. So typically we we try to be pretty conservative on our projections where we're looking at, you know, a fourteen to sixteen percent IRR. So that means you know, like an average return per year. So of a five year deal, usually that's like we're trying to say, hey, can we double the equity? in five years. So that's kind of like, oh, if we can do that, we feel pretty good about it. Maybe not quite or close to close to doubling in five years. So usually there's a mix of cash flow and then there's also the appreciation when you sell. Usually you get paid quite a bit when you sell. Um, We've had several exits. We've had one that was uh, about a 26% annualized return over two and a half years. We had one that was a uh, around a 15% return per year. We just sold another one. I haven't seen the total numbers on that one sold yesterday in Atlanta. Um, my guess is that one's going to be in the 20s or up to between 20 and 30 percent per year. And then we have one that uh, was about a 90 percent IRR in 10 months. So Holy that one we cow. bought, we bought it in Jacksonville. Yeah, we bought it for 27 million and we sold it 10 months later. We plan to hold it six years. We hold it, sold it 10 months later for 37 million. So because wow. we had leveraged that, that was like a 60, 70 percent or more investor return. And we actually 1031 everybody into or a lot of the people into a larger deal. So, again, you know, I try to tell people, hey, make modest projections. But there are some of these that we're going for base hits. But once in a while, we really get a hold of one and you hit a home run. So it happens. Right. So you can't count on that every time. But people that are in that deal are, are pretty excited about it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's it's huge. Look, I'm 52. I started investing 47. Uh, so four or five years ago. And the returns have been phenomenal. And I would just say, I wish I had started like in my 20s and 30s. Um, but the, so the returns, 15, 26%, like I, I've seen that. And I've talked to so many people, like people are getting double your money in you know, two, three, four, five years. Um, crazy numbers that you don't see in the stock market. The one thing you give up, which is, which is definitely true, is liquidity. So, you know, if you invest in the stock market, you can sell at any point in time. You know, it could be down 20% or 30%, but you could sell. In these real estate deals, once you wire the money, you kind of lose control um, from a passive perspective. And it's up to the lead syndicators that they're going to run the deal. um, And they're going to sell the deal or refinance the deal when they think the, the moment is right. 
And then that's when you get your return. So it could be two years down the road. It could be five years down the road. It could be seven years down the road. You, you don't have the control, but the returns, you know, are, are phenomenal, have been phenomenal. I mean, it's not, it's not a guarantee, but they have been phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, and we talked, like I mentioned, I've spoken with a lot of investors and for a lot of people, um, you know, they come from, they, they bought a house or a couple of houses and it's really not passive. You're in single family. It's just really not passive. In my opinion, you can get 20 or 30 of them and then it becomes a job. So, uh, but when you get started in, in real estate investing, um, it does allow you to be able to scale. And, uh, I think, I just think a lot of people, that haven't tried it, you know, like I, I imagine there's this call that I had with a doctor who's worth 5 million. We'll ask, you know, net worth questions, what your net, what's your net worth? And he just never, he'd never invested in real estate before and he'd only done stocks. And so, you know, those conversations are a little more basic, just about how syndication works, what it is, you know, the guy who's invested in 10 syndications, that's a different conversation. You know, we're talking about cap rate inversions and, you know, all the assumptions of other things. But um, for a lot of people, it's just getting them to be able to actually take an action in a deal because for that doctor, if he is able to invest in one or two or three deals, it's almost like a muscle, right? He understands that, okay, I get into this and then he starts seeing the cash flow or he starts seeing how it performs. And then he can start to say, oh man, maybe I could do this with more of my wealth. Well, maybe I actually could replace my income or most of my income or my expenses with just doing this. So it develops this whole other bucket or this whole other pie that you didn't know was there. And so that's the thing that a lot of people just, I, I really love helping people kind of turn the light on on that, that a lot of people just don't see that that's even possible, that you can actually have this Warren Buffett, you know, he says, unless you make money, unless you learn how to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. So a doctor that makes a million plus a year, they're still working for money, right? right? Rather than having the money work for them. A lot of people just don't know how do I get my money working for me. And that's the amazing thing that you and I get to do. And in your deals and my deals, we get to help people to experience that. Yeah, and I, absolutely. And I, that, I act, you said help people. I mean, I feel like, you know, I've been in the church where, you know, they talk about serving and like, I just couldn't get myself to go out and like pick up garbage and like paint houses. But these syndications, it's like you get to help all the passive investors grow their wealth and they all yeah. have different needs for it. Like some people are going to use that for college education. Some people are going to use that to buy a car or go on vacation. Some people are going to use that for their retirement. And, you know, so I feel like it's a way to serve and give back. Yeah, absolutely. You no, know, I think, uh, you know, you talk about spiritual principles. I mean, there's this parable in the Bible called the parable of the talents, right? That's talking about, uh, gold that basically this master went away and gave out all this gold to basically have a return on his investment. And there were a couple servants that they did, they kind of just invested it and they found a way to double it, right? They found a way to find a return on the investment. And I think it's the idea of stewardship, right? That all of us, regardless of your belief system, we have a very limited time on earth. So what are we going to do with it? And so whatever, whether you believe in God or not, it's just that I've got a limited amount of time. What do I want to make this life look like? And when you can have financial freedom, I think it opens up the ability to be able to serve and give back and contribute in many, many, many more ways. My big cause, really, I have a big cause or a big why. There are 20 to 40 million human slaves today. There's something called modern day human slavery. A lot of people don't even know this exists, but there's actually more human slaves today than there's ever been in the history of the world. And it's in almost every city of the world, even in the US. Holy and uh, it's just, yeah, people don't realize it. And about 99% of people that are in this modern day human slavery are never rescued. So to me, my big why is, yeah, I want to, I want to generate a lot of resources, but I want to give a lot of it away to this cause. I want to help educate other people. At some point I may say, I want to start my own organization in this cause to say in this one part of the world saying no more human trafficking here, no more of, of whatever, you know, this is, we need to stop this. So, um, I think having a big why really helps both as an investor, as a syndicator, or just as an individual to say, it's not just about the money. It's about once you're financially free, you actually can give back to causes you believe in. Yeah. No, I, I, I love that. Um, I had somebody say, you know what? I don't need any more. And I'm like, I get that you don't need any more, but you have the capacity to generate a lot more. You, you don't have to keep it. Like, yeah. you know, give it away. Yeah. And, you know, and, but be productive and, because you, you have the skill set you have the energy you you're you know you're still young enough to to go out and do, and do more um yeah 
Hey, talk about conferences. Like people talk about going to conferences and some people are like, see a lot of value in it. And some people are like, well, they just want my money and <laughs> you know, to pay the ticket to yeah. go there. So, you know, people that are typically I'm interviewing, see value in it. Um, but explain to me why you, Going to conferences, networking, meeting other people is of value. Yeah, so a lot of people do say, yeah, I don't want it. Why would I go to a conference? It's time away. It's money. It's effort. Um, I really feel my life began to change in a very profound way when I started going to conferences. I started going to national events. And there's really two things, uh, whether you're a passive investor or you're wanting somebody wants to be active or you're both, um, the, the two things that really can change your life in this field, or I think just about any field, are networking and education. So if it's networking and education, those are the two things, it means, what does that really mean, right? Well, there's a quote by this guy, Charlie Tremendous Jones, and he says, you'll be the same person five Charlie years from now. Charlie Tremendous Jones. I'm sorry, I had, yeah, I, I was, love that. The, the story is he was a motivational speaker and they always said, how are you doing, Charlie? And he said, tremendous. tremendous. You'd just be all excited. <laughs> yeah, so I heard, I think it was Zig Ziglar or somebody talking, but he always said that, tremendous. But he would say, you know, you'll be the same five years from now, except for the books you read and the people that you meet. And so what is that? Okay, well, that's networking and education, right? So that's, you know, networking is meeting people. I met somebody at a meetup and they said, hey, I'd invest in one of your deals. And I was like thinking like, I don't even have a deal, but because I was the one in the front of the room with 60 people, whatever, he, he, he said, hey, I want to invest in one of your deals. So I got coffee with him and that opened up a door. When I met this other syndicator was really successful. I said, hey, can I help you with your money? Can I help on this side or whatever? It led to raising $15 million. Again. It was very transformational. For a lot of people that are passive investors, you need to meet other passive investors. You need to meet other sponsors. You need to be in the room and that will really change who you are. The second thing is you can read books, you can you know get educational stuff, you go to conferences and you get a lot of information. So I, I'm like, a, I'm a little bit of a conference junkie. I probably need to like cut back on my conferences. I've probably been in 2022, I've probably been to 15 to 20 conferences this year. So I probably, like, I, I, I'm more on the side of like, yeah, it's really good, but man, I need to, but I just, I just, I feel like there's always something serendipitous, serendipitous that happens. There's always a door that opens. And so I go to a lot of them and people right. give me and I take pictures and put them on social media. They'd be like, oh my gosh, you're everywhere. But it's like, that's what I want to be. I want to be in a place where I'm meeting new people and learning. And so I think, I think they're awesome. That's huge. Hey, um, you've done so much already, man. Like what, what's the next big stretch goal for you? Uh, I'm a big goals guy. So <laughs> I got a lot of goals. Um, next year, 2023, my goal is to release my first book. So I haven't read, written a book yet. So that's a goal on my list. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm considering starting a high-end mastermind, just dealing with creating community around deal flow and kind of working on that, maybe creating some courses and just continue to do more deals. I love the business. I love doing deals. I love bringing, you know, educating people and then helping them to get into a place. And just like you were saying, it's very meaningful to help somebody to start to experience, uh, an investment like this. That's not, I mean, it's just, it's so, it feels to me, it's so backwards that we've been taught that, and I was a registered investment advisor for a couple of years, but we've been taught that traditional investments are stocks and bonds, right? which they're, they're really not, they're, they're paper assets, first of all. They're not actually physical things. They're paper assets. They have incredible volatility. I mean, if something goes down, could down, go down by 50% in the next 12 months, would you want to do it? But this, that happens all the time in stocks. Like there's certain stocks, individuals, or even as a group, even as indexes. So for most people, that's what they stick with and that's fine, but there are other alternatives. So I'm super passionate about trying to help people to understand how to grow in Main Street type of investments is what we call them, right? Like things like your deals or my deals or other people's just things not in Wall Street. Because I think Wall Street is just fundamentally set up to steal from you in a way. Like it sounds really harsh, but I think it's it's set up to really take advantage of individual people. And even if things don't do well in the market, they're still gonna get their fees. They're still gonna make their money. They're still gonna get even hidden fees. So I think, um, I feel like it's, it's a real cause to say, hey, Let's all of us continue to reach people and really share the message of you can get way more wealth and do it with much less risk in things like multifamily or other sorts of assets. Yeah, that's that's great. And uh, it's it's about getting the word out there, you know, um, and for for the other people that are only in stocks, like what what's the harm in diversifying and seeing and then you compare and you're like, holy cow, I'm going to do more of that like your doctor buddy. Um, the other thing is 
liquidity sometimes can help, like the illiquidity. So in COVID, okay, I had passive investors in, in deals and some deals were like, it was scary time. Like, are people going to pay rent, you know? And that may have been a time where a bunch of passive investors would have sold their investment, right? Mm-hmm. And, but they couldn't, right? Because they were in right. the deal and it wasn't a good time to sell. And then all of a sudden a year goes by and then you, you're cash flow positive and then the value of the property goes up and you sell and you get a big win. And the passive investors are like, thank you. Well, <laughs> some of those passive investors, if they could have sold, may have sold. So sometimes that liquidity can help you. So, yeah. hey, if people want to reach out to you and get to know you better, what's the best place for them to do that? Um, awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Um, my website, bronsonequity.com. I've got this ebook. People can download it. It's a great way to kind of get started. We also have our investor club. I'm also on social media on LinkedIn, Facebook, some of the others. So you can reach out. Love to connect with anybody. And this has been a lot of fun, Darren. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on. And I, I think you shared so many different things. Uh, you know, one about investing in multifamily, but two, also, I think there's a big mindset shift that people have to, to do in order to get into this world. And you talked a lot about that and you had personal experience with that. So I appreciate you sharing that as well. Uh, listeners, until next week, uh, signing off, definitely check out his website, Bronson Hill. What is it? BronsonEquity.com. And he's got the free uh, ebook on inflation, which is very applicable to what's going on right now. So um, check, take a look at that and we'll catch up next week. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com learn. 